Hello and welcome to another TLDR EU video. It's no secret by now that the last few months, years and even decades for Europe have been far from easy. From Black Wednesday to the 2008 financial crisis and the subsequent sovereign debt crisis to the present day and the pandemic. Europe has, at times of crisis, for better or worse, come together as a single bloc to form the European Union. The question being, what exactly is the EU meant to be? A solely economic bloc, a single market, or something more profound, a political union, or even a United States of Europe? So, in this video, we'll take a look at a major YouGov survey conducted for the European University's Institute for European Governance and Political Programme and look closely at exactly what Europe's people believe the EU should be. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to this channel and hitting the bell icon to be notified every time we post. TLDR EU is currently racing TLDR US to see who can get to 100,000 subscribers fastest. And although the US is ahead, the EU's gaining speed faster. So if you want to lend the EU a hand, then be sure to subscribe. Before we start, a quick footnote. All survey data, unless specified otherwise, has been taken from the YouGov and European University Institute survey, which we've linked to in the video's description. If we've taken a specific point deeper and used other data or sources, as has become standard in our videos, we'll have linked those sources down below too. Anyway, back to the video, and first things first, let's go through some background on the survey. In April this year, YouGov surveyed some 21,000 people across 14 European countries. Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Hungary, Italy, Lithuania, the Netherlands, Poland, Romania, Spain, Sweden and the UK and asked them about a number of topics, ranging from the role of the EU in wider global affairs to its spending and military power. So, without further ado, let's get into the details. People were asked what type of Europe they prefer to live in, with three options. A protective Europe that defends a European way of life and welfare against internal and external threats, in effect a protectionist Europe, a global Europe that acts as a leader on climate, human rights and global peace, in effect providing a global benchmark, or alternatively a market union that stresses economic integration, market competition and fiscal discipline. In effect, a Europe with liberalisation at its heart. The vast, vast majority of respondents seem to favour the protective option, with the Greeks being the most emphatic supporters, with support standing at 57%, falling to 42% for France and Spain, 38% for Poland, 35% for Germany and the Netherlands, 31% for Sweden and Denmark, and just 18% for the UK. All in all, 10 countries displayed the greatest support for the protective option. The remaining four countries, consisting of the UK, Germany, Sweden and Denmark, all backed the global option, with the strongest support coming from Sweden at 42%, and then the UK at 40, then Germany and Denmark both at 37. The weakest support came from Romania, where only 22% of people backed a global Europe. No country backed a market Europe, not even the members of the so-called Frugal Four, whom we've talked about a lot in our recent videos. Or even the UK, which is widely seen as a market-oriented, now former member of the EU. That being said, some 25% of Italians did back the option, although support quickly declined for other countries, hitting a low of 8% for Greece. Then came the notion of solidarity, whether Europe should come together at times of crisis and step in to help its neighbours. Specifically, people were asked, now imagine another country in Europe or in the European Union is suffering X. Now, do you think that your country should or shouldn't provide any major help? With eight scenarios put forward, a natural disaster, an epidemic or major public health crisis, a military attack, being particularly affected by the consequences of climate change, being left behind by changes in technology, a major refugee crisis, a major unemployment crisis, or a major debt crisis. A score was then attributed to each, with positive numbers meaning a country was generally willing to help, and negative ones when they were generally unwilling. All 14 countries were overwhelmingly in favour for offering support in the event of a natural disaster, with the highest support again coming from Greece at a score of 78, and the weakest support coming from Finland at 35. A picture which was replicated for epidemic and military attack. 
Only when it came to the consequences of climate change did the first instance of a country being generally unwilling to help occur, specifically Finland, with a score of negative 11. From then onwards, more and more countries began to declare their unwillingness to support other countries, with countries broadly split geographically on matters of refuge, unemployment or debt crises. With the south and east of Europe broadly in support of helping out, and the north and west broadly not. In all of these scenarios, however, people vastly prefer a more structured approach to support, with support being led by the EU through a permanent system, rather than a piecemeal, unilateral case-by-case initiative, with the winners and losers from a structural fund again surveyed. Respondents were asked if there was a large EU-wide emergency fund for EU countries to draw on when they faced a variety of different types of crises, do you think that over a long period of time, your country would ultimately be an overall winner or loser? In other words, whether the help received from the fund would ultimately exceed the resources put in or not. Again, Greece was the strongest respondent when it came to overall winners, with 66% responding that they believed that Greece would overall be a net beneficiary, with just 18% of Greeks saying that they'd be a net contributor. In just three other countries was there an outright majority saying that their country would be a net beneficiary, Spain, Hungary and Romania. The likes of France and Germany, seen by many as keystones of the European Union, are more tentative. Just 28% of French respondents replied that they thought France would be a winner, and 37% a loser, with 35% saying they didn't know. Germany had just 20% of respondents saying it would be a winner, 31% not knowing, and 49% believing that Germany would be a loser. Again, Finland was at the bottom of the pack when it came to believing that they'd be a winner, with just 15% seeing Finland as a winner, 62% as a loser, and 23% not knowing. The survey also touched on the political fallout of Brexit. When it came to offering financial assistance, people were asked their opinions about helping out with regards to 35 countries. Of the 35 countries YouGov asked people if they'd be willing to assist, the United Kingdom came in 33rd, tied with Tunisia and only above Colombia. The survey explicitly preempts comments that the opposition to helping the UK arises from the fact it's a rich country, with them stating it's not simply just the case that the UK is a rich country, so people won't donate on the basis that the UK can afford to look after itself. People are far more willing to provide financial assistance to other top European countries like Germany and France. On the taxation front, Europeans were significantly more in support of tax revenues being spent elsewhere in Africa than in the EU. In 7 of the 13 EU countries, there was a stronger support for foreign aid than intra-European aid. People are also markedly more in favour of a more active EU when it comes to immigration, the economic situation, climate change, health and social security, terrorism, the environment, unemployment, crime, inflation, working and living conditions and education, with much more tepid support for energy and housing, with significant division over taxation. Only Greece, Italy, Poland, Hungary and Romania were in favour of the EU raising and crucially spending more money. Only Sweden was against a financial transaction tax, and only Sweden and Denmark opposed a digital services tax. Then came the issue of integration. The European Union has never had a defined integration path. Ever since its inception, integration has been based on the concept known as Monet integration. That means small step-by-step integration, gradually bringing more and more competencies under the EU's umbrella, with each step de facto requiring another step forward, emphasised by the notion of an ever closer union at the heart of the EU. That said, some countries, especially the UK, were and are sceptical about handing over more and more powers without a certainty of retaining other powers later down the line. Hence the call for a two-speed Europe, where one area would integrate quicker than the other. If you want us to dive deeper into this, make sure to like this video and leave a comment down below. Anyway, people were asked if they opposed such a two-speed approach. Overall, there's very little public opposition to the idea, with the highest support again coming from Greece at 21%. It's a similar story when it comes to opt-outs, either from the Euro or Schengen. Just Germany opposed the idea of granting more opt-outs. And on the idea of the Euro, 
Most countries agreed that EU member states should eventually be required to join the single currency, even non-members such as Hungary and Romania. That's not to say that there's no opposition though. Denmark and Sweden, both out of the euro area, are strongly against. And on the military front, while a large number of EU members are also NATO members, there's a division on whether focusing on NATO or expanding the EU's joint defence capability should take precedence. The UK, Denmark, Romania, Lithuania, Poland, the Netherlands, Hungary and Sweden all back a NATO-focused approach. So that's what Europe thinks, but what do you think? Should Europe head forward towards further deeper integration, firmly apply the brakes or stick the entire project into reverse? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, you can also get involved in the conversation over on Discord. To find more content like this in the future, then be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon. Special thanks to our Patreon, and finally, a special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. To see your name listed at the end of the videos just like these people, then consider, back then consider backing us on Patreon. There's a link to that down below.